Well, hello and welcome to North Point Church. My name is Pastor Rob Wilson. Welcome. It's so good to have you worshiping with us online. We consider you all to be part of our church family. And so would you drop me an email sometime to rob at np-church.org? And we'd love to hear from our online worshiping community. So today we continue on in our Reservoir of Vision sermon series. And today we're looking at the issue of being a church that is, has theological clarity. Um, open your Bible to John chapter 15, and Jesus is going to say, I am the vine. You are the branches. There's a lot of other false vines out there that we try to grow and root and, and be nourished by in our life. And, and Jesus says that they, they, um, if they're not rooted in him, they, they wither up and, and they die and, the, and they're cast away. So there's a message for us, for you, today in John chapter 15. Welcome to worship at North Point Church. Grace the power of sin and darkness, His love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King of peace. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. God presents us with challenges in life. I think all of us face them at, at one time or another. Um, he has beset me with several, obviously. But what I have learned through the years is that because of the challenges, I have learned to depend on God. And because I have done that, uh, he shows his strength through my weakness. And I think that's something that we all need to remember my life has been really challenging lately. Mm. But what I have found, and I was thinking about this in choir practice a week ago, that living in the moment, being grateful for the things that you find in the moment, really sets us free and shows God's strength. So look for the little things. God is there. He's working in your life. You just have to recognize it. So... Uh, I know right now it's a really challenging time worldwide. Um, and it's, it's prayer that will get us through this. And we have to remember that God is in control. And we just have to rest in those promises. Hmm. Let's just take a, a couple moments to think about a little thing. <laughs> Maybe that God's doing in your life. Some small joy and how that expresses God's character in your life. Just take a few moments. Open the eyes of the blind There's no one alive 
and we offer God our confession, we join in a beautiful work of reconciliation, which begins with God's reconciling love to us, as we just sung of. So trusting our Lord in grace, let us make our confession, first in silence, and then I'll pray for us. God of tender mercies, we admit that sometimes we don't know what to do within ourselves. We anger at the slightest insult and imagine great vengeance upon those who wronged us. We laze about in the good news of our faith and do not yet consider the deep commitment of it. We care for ourselves, but not always for others. Lord Jesus, forgive us, we pray. Forgive us, help us to repent, help us turn, and make us whole as we do. Amen. Friends in Christ, know this. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting, and I remind you of the surpassing reckless love that God meets you with today. In Jesus Christ, let me assure you, we are forgiven. Amen. O oh Christ, we come with empty hands our broken pieces bring. We offer you our weary, wandering hearts. Please take each peace, forgive each sin, and make us whole again. Refine us by your Spirit's holy fire. You are the author of
friends, let us be the church in prayer. Let's be the people in prayer for each other, for our world this morning. Would you join me? God who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, God who is a God of relationships, even within yourself, we come this morning praying from the Psalter for the peace of Jerusalem. For it says to us, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together. To it the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as he decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For there the thrones for judgment were set up, the thrones of the house of David. Pray, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper, those who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers, O Jerusalem. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace, peace be within you. And for the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. So Lord, as we pray together as your body here, as we pray for shalom and wholeness to envelop not only your holy city, but all the tribes and tongues of every human life you've created, we do so in recognition today, Lord, that our world is far from shalom, far from peace. Missiles are being fired. Armies are mobilizing for battle. And violent death, along with its pain that it brings, will envelop the land where you called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, where you revealed yourself in flesh through our Savior Jesus, where he taught the land he prayed and even wept over Jerusalem. Today, Lord, we weep with you. And we lift our prayers for your justice and your mercy to reign in this time of world conflict. Lord, we lift our fervent prayers for conflict in much smaller worlds, our own. Conflict in marriages, conflict in families, conflicts between friends and coworkers. Our hope is found, Lord, in finding you, who is the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, let us look to you, Lord, call upon you again and again. We would ask, Lord, that you bless the peacemakers, and we ask a blessing upon them, and even that we become peacemakers in our world, in our marriages, in our families, in our workplaces, in every place you've called us to be your witness. We turn inward now, Lord, to the conflict within ourselves, our battles with sin that we just confessed to you, our own dysfunctions, and the chaos of our disordered passions and drives. You know them, Lord. And so, Lord, we will don the full armor that you have given us in Scripture, the full armor of God that we may stand against the devil's schemes, put upon each person here the belt of truth, Lord, the breastplate of righteousness, Fit our feet with the gospel of peace. Lord, help us to take up the shield of faith and place firmly upon us the helmet of salvation offered to us in Jesus Christ. Let us take up the sword, the sword of your spirit. And Holy Spirit, overwhelm us as we sit here right now. Not with this world's darkness, but overwhelm us in our own little worlds, and in our own little darknesses, that we may feel the warmth right now, the warmth of your light, your grace, your goodness, your mercy. In the silence of this sanctuary, Lord, a sanctuary that we have dedicated to you as being holy, hear our own prayers and petitions for people we love who need you so desperately.
And now, O God of all creation, God of power and might, Lord Jesus, full of mercy and truth and Holy Spirit that surrounds us right now, we proclaim the name of Jesus that calms the storms and brings healing to the broken. We pray together now the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right. So I want to welcome you back to this sermon series that we've been doing called Reservoirs of Vision. Um, that, that word reservoir can be translated in Hebrew as a pool, right, or a trench. And we're using that main text um, from 2 Kings chapter 3. You can look that up if this is your first time or you've just been here the last few weeks. Look up 2 Kings 3, and there you'll hear a story where God asked these um, armies who had gathered for battle in a dry and drought-filled, thirsty land to build trenches, pools, reservoirs in preparation for the blessing of water that, that God would pour out so this is a series about vision. And you know, vision, without it, any organization finds themselves um, in a similar place as those armies did. They, they find themselves in a place of dryness when you don't have vision, right? And, and just kind of thirsty for meaning and purpose. And so our leadership here at North Point Church um, for a while now has been in a season of discernment. Um, and thus far, of, of what, are, what are those pools or those reservoirs that God is calling us to prepare and dig and, and be proactive about? And so far in this sermon series, as you can see, we've looked at the, the pool of structure and organization. We had a message on the pool of growing disciples. Last week, we looked at this pool of um, valuing children and youth and families and ministering to them just because of our sheer location, right? But, but also at the same time, we call that the multi-generational church, making sure that um, we value every age group here at North Point Church because we are a multi-generational church. And I actually think that's a really healthy and cool thing. Um, and so we especially want to even value what, um, is what we call the sages of the congregation. So this morning, though, we are going to turn to that next reservoir. I call it theological clarity. And as a foundation of theological clarity, right, we echo that sage wisdom that was put into a creed centuries ago. We call it the Apostles' Creed. And uh, it'll be on the screen behind me. And why, do, why don't we say the uh, Apostles' Creed together? Let's, let's say these words together. Please join me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, our Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. And those, amen, yes, those were the foundational, foundational words that called the, the early church together. 
Um, that word, amen, do you know, it means um, let it be. It's a, I can stand upon this. It's a solid word. It's, it's a rock word. And it's a foundational word. And so we say it at the end of the creed. And, and yet, isn't it funny that although we know, right, that these are our foundational tenets of faith, isn't it funny how easily we can wander from theological clarity around the essentials into those persnickety non-essentials. They get in the way, don't they? I said, isn't it funny, but truly it is sad, sometimes even tragic. Jesus knew this so well, all too well. He knew it because he knew human nature. We remember in John chapter 1 that Jesus was there in the beginning, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things came into being through Him, and without Him, not one thing came into being. And what has come into being in Him is life. And that life is the light of all people. And yet, yet, Jesus, knowing our nature, we continue to wander, don't we? And he knew this too because he was, became flesh and dwelt among us in, in, in a time when there were a lot of Jewish sects out there, a lot of Jewish groups, and, and they were all Jewish. They all affirmed the God of Israel, but they had vastly different views about, about God and the world because of the non-essentials. So let's look at a couple of those groups, the Pharisees. We have the Pharisees. We know the Pharisees. They'd wandered from God-centeredness into law-centeredness. And the Sadducees, that was another group in Jesus' time, they wandered from that God-centeredness to temple and sacrificial-centeredness. And we know this from the disciples themselves, right? The disciples themselves, they're constantly wandering from Christ-centeredness and, and to self-centeredness. They were constantly th- asking about who's going to be the greatest among us and which one of us is going to get to do this and get to do that. And, and the truth is that, that we know, we know this tendency because we know it in ourselves. You don't have to look at church history. You know it in yourself. We know it of our own lives, how easy it is to become distracted. We wander, as the great hymn says, right? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. So in John's gospel, it is recorded for us seven I am statements, they're called, where Jesus says, I am, and then he fills in the blank. Seven different times he does this. And which one day we'll do a whole sermon series on the seven I am's. They are so great. But for this morning, we're going to go to the last one. The very final I am statement in the Gospel of John comes in John 15. So if you brought your own Bible with you today, open it to John 15. I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And, um, and uh, actually, I think it's the New American Standard Bible, sorry. Uh, and I'm going to read from, from that version, but open yours or follow along on the screen. And as we do, would you open your heart, open your mind, that God may plant a seed for you today. This is an agriculture, another agriculture-based um, image that Jesus is going to give. Friends, let's listen for what God's saying to you this morning. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are, are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. The one who abides in me and I in him, they bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And if anyone does not abide in me, they are thrown away as a branch and dries up. 
And they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Friends, this is God's word given to us today. And we say together, thanks be to God. By the way, if um, you want to keep reading in the Gospel of John, that's a great chapter because the next two sections in John 15, um, that section talks about us relating to Jesus, but the next two talk about us relating to others and us relating to the world. So great text for you to kind of go home and continue to to read on. Um, But let's for now be in a moment of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this word this word that reminds us of where we are to be grafted into on a daily basis so that we may not only abide, but that we may bear fruit. And so be with us now, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, fall upon us. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts here, be acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. One of... um, One of my preaching mentors, the late Reverend Earl Palmer, uh, told a story in a message years ago about a young man who had been raised in their congregation. And this young man's mother came to him after the young man went off to college and he got his first job and um, he found himself in a religious movement, his mother thought it a cult. And she asked, Earl, would you, you know, meet with him and and just talk with him? I'm really worried about him and some of his behavior. And and Earl asked to meet with this young man and um, talk to him about this quasi-Christian group. And Earl had great wisdom, which he says in, in the message was not from him, but rather the Holy Spirit, instead of kind of laying in and saying, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Right? He, he listened first. And he, he said, hey, tell me what you like about this, this group and, and how you're nourished by them. And, and the young man got really excited, and, and he, he said, well, I, I love how they are so they are a well-defined group. And once you're in the group, you are in the group, and they support each other so well. He talked about how they had a strong moral code that they enforced in their own life, in their community life, and it was a strong moral code where black was black, white was white, right? And, and they were also very clean-cut, he said. And that uh, was attractive to this young man. They were clean-cut young professionals. They were driven and... and um, very successful people, and he went on and on and raved. And then Earl said, he said, so let me ask you, is there anything that troubles you about this group? Is there anything that's maybe gnawing at you a little bit? And he thought for a moment, this young man, he said, well, I do have to say, I love a majority of what this group stands for, but there's this little thing that troubles me. And, and Earl said, well, what's that little thing? And, and he said, you know, they have some funny teachings about Jesus. And Earl thought for a moment and he said, son, I think you have your major things and your minor things mixed up here. <laughs> See, all of those things you listed, a strong moral code and a sense of community and focusing on being clean cut and successful, well, all good, but they're not the major thing. They're the minors. The major thing always is, is what we believe and live into about Jesus. And when we think about Jesus and our centeredness on Jesus as Lord, that is the essential thing, right? A light bulb went off in this young man's head at that moment. And and, uh, just that thinking about what was he centering himself in. Jesus Christ says, I am the true vine. And you are the branches. Abide in me. Now, if there's true vines, if there's one true vine, it means there's a lot of false vines. 
This is a really exclusive statement. Notice Jesus didn't say, um, I, I, I think, a, he didn't say a strong moral code <laughs> or a sense of community or a successful, uh, being successful in the world is the vine. He was very, very clear. I am the vine. I am the true vine. You see, in all of our reservoirs of vision that we are looking at, this is the one, theological clarity is the one that is first and foremost, keeping Christ as our center, running everything that we do as a church family, as we do as individuals through this center, right? Running everything that we do and say and dream as a church, it must be grown from the vine, Otherwise, it's going to wither. And the same is true, by the way. This isn't just kind of a church sermon for our congregation. This is for you. Think about your own life, right? This is for you. He, he, he knows that to abide in your life, you need to be grafted, right, into him as the vine. And everything then grows in a healthful and nourishing way. The same is true for your own life. Jesus' last I am statement, when you really think about this, it leaves no other alternative. <laughs> it's undeniable. He knew, he knew, didn't he, that his followers, as well as you and I, we struggle with this. It's, it's true. Every organization, every, every Christian, we struggle with this. We have a tendency that the disciples had a tendency in our thinking about God and, and, and how we live in, in trying to grow ourselves off of different vines in the world. I've um, commented to you in one of my first sermons here at North Point two years ago that one of the, the most helpful images for us, I believe, as 21st century American Christians is, is this image that is set in my head. It involves the disciples whom Jesus chose. Think about the disciples. Think of um, this group of, of people that he called to follow him. I believe that there were two of them he called very specifically to teach this lesson of John 15. And it's um, Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot. Matthew, let's look at him first. He's a tax collector, all right? And as you probably know, tax collectors were not liked. In the, in the ancient Israeli world. And why was that? Well, tax collectors were seen as being traitors to the Jewish faith because they collected taxes for the Romans. And many times that taxation was um, more like extortion. I don't know if you know how they collected. It. It's not like they had an IRS like we do now and you filled out a form and sent it in and a check. That's not how it worked. The tax collector would come to you. The tax collector had a responsibility to get Rome their taxes. But once they received that amount that they could send on to Rome that was demanded of them as tax collectors, their salary came from a surplus tax. You might feel like going across the bridge when you pay that toll every time you go across. It, it was a little bit extra. And, and so some tax collectors took great advantage of that and became very wealthy because of their high taxes. So not only are they kind of ripping people off in many ways, but they're also working with Rome. That was Matthew. And then we have Simon. Simon was a zealot. Zealots, I don't know if you know this, they were another Jewish group at Jesus' time that, um, that believed strongly, strongly in reclaiming their Israeli identity and getting out from underneath Rome and Rome's power over them. They wanted the Romans out. And they even believed that they should take violent action that it was okay to take violent action against Roman officials, even assassinations, which did happen, in order to, again, again, put Israel back into an independent political power. So Matthew and Simon, think about this, they would have detested one another. They would have feared one another. They would have thought it not right to be in the presence of one another, all for political reasons. So what is their vine? Their vine was their politics, right? And it must have come about on many occasions over their three years. Many occasions 
when Jesus and Matthew and Simon and the others gathered around the campfire in the evenings, or when they were eating a meal together at the table, or just walking down those dusty, dirty roads in the Holy Land when those touchy issues of politics came up. And what I like to picture is Jesus walking down the road, and he has Simon the Zealot in one arm, and I like to picture his other arm around Matthew the tax collector. And they walk down the road, and Jesus is teaching them of their true identity, their true vine, which is not found in politics. You can almost hear Jesus saying, can't you, when you listen to John 15, you can almost hear Jesus saying to them, remember, gentlemen, I am the true vine. You're the branches. I know you have your own politics. I know you have your own views on social issues. I I know you have your own ideas about how to live in this world and in community, your own thoughts on moral codes, but it's me. I am the true vine. And apart from me, you're going to be able to do nothing. Those things must come. And they are there, right? The realities of our views on politics and social issues and and how the church is to be. But they can only come after we are rooted in the vine, rooted in Jesus. Jesus demanded it as an, an essential. That is the one essential that matters. And he demands that of us as well. This wasn't just for Simon the Zealot. This just wasn't for Matthew the tax collector. It was for all the disciples. It was for all the world. It is for you and I that he says these words. In fact, let's apply this to your life. Where might Jesus be speaking to you in John 15, verses 1 through 8? Read it over this week. Read it over. Read read Jesus' passionate, passionate plea and about the helplessness we find ourselves in when we dry up and we we find ourselves in fear from all these false vines that are out there, where might our own lives be centered and grafted into less than ultimate, non-essential, persnickety vines? Now, let's be clear and let's talk real life here because in a political year coming up we are going to need this is going to be a presidential year coming a presidential election year we are going to need to remember this every church should right we need to remember that sitting in this congregation right now we have Simon the Republicans and Matthew the Democrats we have people who are pro this and people who are anti this We have people who have a variety and a diversity of opinions on things that you might hold really, really strong to, but the reality is that we as Christians, we have proven to be just as divisive over a lot lesser thing than politics. We can be so divisive over little, little things. The attitude of, I'm leaving this church, Pastor, because... The color of the carpet that you're going to put in. Or that person who attends here and you say, I can't stand them. (laughs) So I'm gone. (laughs) I'm going to get around a lot of people who look like me and think like me. And and, and those are the people I'm going to hang out with. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what Jesus did. How about those people who say, if you don't meet all my needs and wants, in, that's a much lower bar, right, than politics, then I'm gone. I once had a church member in a former congregation. I hope they're not watching this. Let's blank out this part of the sermon. Threatened to leave our congregation in the midst of a remodeling building project we were doing. It was both a remodel and we were building a new part. And um, part of the kitchen was being rebuilt. We had a great kitchen in that congregation, but we wanted, and we used it for meals to the community, and and we wanted to um, make it a professional grade kitchen because we wanted to use it as a community resource for teaching cooking classes and some other things. So that meant, because of that and the size of the kitchen, that it was going to be expanded to, and in the county codes, it meant that that church kitchen had to be ADA compatible, okay, which meant that the countertops had to be lowered 
just an inch and a half, an inch and a half. It had, they had to be lowered. I think it was an inch and a half. And um, you would not believe the number of meetings I attended about the countertops. The church countertops took on a life of their own. And people literally said, oh, we cannot do that. We know that it would be nicer for people in wheelchairs, but, and we know it's county code, but it's going to be too hard on my back. My back's going to get achy, you know, working on kitchens like this. And they actually said that after, this one individual said to me um, that after um, we had an occupancy permit and could move into the building, that they would pay, personally pay, to have the countertops raised up or else I'm leaving. It's a low bar, no pun intended. You see what's happening? You see what's happening? When we become a community around me and my non-essentials, then we become a different kind of church. We don't become the church of the vine. We don't become a church of Jesus. We become the church of low countertops or the church of beige carpet or blue Bibles or hymnals. Nowhere in the Apostles' Creed, nowhere in John 15, nowhere in the Gospels do we find countertops as the vine from which we will flourish in our ministry and that we are spiritually fed by. We have to ask ourselves that question. Nowhere does Jesus say these little persnickety non-essentials will matter in the end. As a matter of fact, he says the opposite. They will matter none, not I know you're wondering about the countertops. We didn't move them. We didn't move those countertops. We left them at the level, and those people, of course, did stay. Even when the cause we're extolling is a good and just cause, perhaps even a cause that we find with a biblical mandate, where it be a social justice cause or a stand on a social issue or good morals, um, Jesus doesn't say to include those things in the vine. What does Jesus say? I am your vine. Abide in me. That's a strong, strong word in the Greek language. It's the word meno. And um, it is a strong word, a holding word. We are to be held closely to Jesus and Jesus alone. So for us at North Point, we are going to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. We are going to keep our eyes on the good news of his gospel as our essential. And in all, and I mean all those persnickety non-essentials, we're going to walk with Jesus with an arm around us and an arm around the person who disagrees with us. That person, that man or woman who sees things differently than us. See, Jesus is teaching us there's room for that if and only if. You abide in me. And that's the important thing. He's the only one strong enough to hold us in that center. He's the only one. Having theological clarity around Christ-centeredness and being a Christ-centered church is not easy. It's a lot easier to be a church with a non-essential center. It really is. Because then you can attract, like that young man, you can attract people, right, who, who are attracted to those things. So this is not easy, what I'm saying. It's not easy what Jesus taught. But it's essential having theological clarity. I don't know if you know this. The hard news for you, if you don't, is that we're in the Presbyterian denomination. And honestly, our denomination um, is declining rapidly and um, and in a worrying way. And, And I personally, I personally believe that that is because we as a denomination um, have oftentimes made our center, our focus, non-essentials. And that that has led to our decline. And there are some other things in there as well. But I tell you that to say that um, at my former congregation in, in Colorado, um, one, one, one day I'm in worship, I see a visitor in the back. It was a, a, a woman. And um, you need to know, too, that um, 
our church in, in that presbytery was one of the few growing Presbyterian churches and um, growing numerically and I think spiritually as well. And after worship, this woman approached me and she said, hey, um, I am from Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Well, I, that's, that was my seminary. I went to Louisville Seminary. And she said, you know, I, I'm here in Colorado. I've just been traveling a bit and we heard about your church. And I'm, in, I'm the director of the alumni magazine, and we would like, you know those alumni magazines that publish those glossy stories and to, to motivate you to give? She said, we are considering doing an article on your congregation and how you all are growing in this season. And um, I'm just interested in hearing a little bit about what you think is growing this congregation. She said, I mean, what's, you know, what are you doing? And um, um, I sat down with her in, in the back of the church. I'll never forget this. And I said to her, well, it's really not that complicated. I, we aren't doing anything magical. And she said, well, do you have a, a, a social cause that you've taken up? Do you, are you targeting a certain demographic to reach? Um, um, you must be doing something. And I said, no, really, really, all we do is we say that our ministry here is going to be Christ-centered. And that we know there are issues that we radically disagree on, but we are committed to loving each other through Christ and in Christ. That even though I disagree with this person, this Simon the Zealot over here, I disagree with him and I even detest the Zealots, I'm still committed to love that person through Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, she looked at me with utter disappointment. Utter disappointment. My seminary, you need to know, is if it was a very progressive, liberal, theologically liberal seminary. I don't mean that politically. I mean theologically liberal. And they were all about a lot of different social causes. And um, she was so disappointed in that. And she said, thank you for your time. And I never heard from her again. <laughs> never, never did I ever get my face on a glossy, uh, a glossy magazine from Louisville Presbyterian Seminary. And by the way, let me say one word about that, and then we'll wrap things up for today. I do credit that seminary with a lot of things in my own development as a pastor because what I learned at that seminary was to be in community with people that I disagreed with radically. Professors, other students, and we would go at it. You know, when you're in seminary, you really hold these values strongly, right? And, and you argue them out in classrooms. And, and I learned to love the person apart from, apart from those persnickety non-essentials. That has been a great tool in pastoral ministry. It's a great tool for us. And so let me close by giving you one of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes that is true for us, and it's what we're going to do, and I challenge you to do in your life. Look for Christ. Look for Christ, and you will find him. And with him, everything else. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we look for you. We look for you, and your arms are wide open. We thank you for the assurance that not only will we find you, but everything else and how we relate to this world that is so divisive and broken, especially right now. Um, Lord, we just offer you this prayer as a church that we will be your church, not ours, not our own views, not our own opinions. We'll be yours. So Lord Jesus, lead us and help us to love each other as you loved us. We ask all this in the powerful name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people together said, Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cause is strong, this solid ground. This time and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving ceases, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Let's go. Oh,
Point Church, would you just pause for a moment, close your eyes, and would you feel right now um, an arm of warmth and grace and goodness coming around your shoulder and holding on to you? And that is your Lord Jesus that we just sang of. And on the other side of him is that thing, that person, that issue, which is totally opposite of you but they believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior too. And now I charge you to go forth and walk together with them. Walk to out these doors and know that centered, rooted in Jesus Christ, he has great plans for you and us. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the word of Jesus, it said, I will go with you forever and always, even to the end of all things. May that make you say together, Amen.